How are you? How's I'm your Spanish? Uh, bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's okay. So this is going to be uh, conducted in, in English, and uh, many of our fans also here uh, speak English, so you'll get a, a lot of questions. And um, and so let's let's start from the beginning. Uh, as you know, I have this pair of Celestians that I actually have not inspected. We're gonna mm -hmm. we're gonna unbox them and we're gonna look at the good or the bad news together. And um, I can always delete the video. <laughs> <laughs> and, and here's Dolly. Hey, Dolly. Dolly is waiting for a treat that will never arrive. Because I don't <laughs> have any treats. Sorry. Not here. <laughs> anyway. And uh, so tell me about, about yourself. You used to work in Celestium. That's that correct. Right? Yes. Manufacturer? Yes. Yep. Uh, so on the uh, crossover uh circuit boards and the uh hf units was what i worked on and was this sort of like an assembly line thing or were you in a little department where you no i th this this would have been purely on the production line i had big ideas to to be in the research and development department but th that was all very secret stuff um, I'm good friends with a lot of people who were in that department at the time. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, a couple of my friends were pretty instrumental in, in the SL series. So you told me, I think, in the past that, that one of your friends uh, was one of the chief designers and he came up with the Twitter design? Or <clears throat> that's, that's kind of right. So my friend Ed Form was the technical director. Um, so he was the right at the top and the designers would have worked underneath him and he is responsible for taking the copper tweeter which was designed by boaz eli eli which was very complicated to make it was done by electroplating which is a jewelry uh procedure and it's very difficult to do and the weight of the units fluctuated so all of all of the copper variants, the crossovers, were tuned by hand. Ed discovered a way of manufacturing aluminium, which they could produce them more effectively, more efficiently, and aluminium's lighter than copper, so the HF unit was more efficient, made the overall efficiency better. Also, probably copper with, ox with oxidation... Um. Well, that copper wasn't... suffer from wouldn't that change the mass of the of the if it gets you know how it gets stained like a like so, a coin? Yeah, copper can suffer with uh, uh, well, pure copper won't it? It will tarnish. It ends up with um, patina is the mm. term. So a lot of the not all of the copper tweeters are very shiny anymore. Some of them. Are, are quite matte in their appearance they're dull but i've not found anything that shows that affects the performance to be honest with you and i've never seen any that have gone green yet but it could happen however uh they, they used to be uh maybe the generalization that the tweeters were a little bit dim sounding or a little bit too warm because it wasn't as efficient as the aluminum dome is that correct yeah so Celestian developed the first commercially used metal dome tweeter in, in a hi-fi speaker. There were other metal dome tweeters, I think, before that, but this was, you know, commercially produced. And because copper's quite heavy, um, it did make them less efficient. And the base driver had to be made less efficient as well, which gave them an overall sensitivity of 82 decibels, which is really low. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty appalling by today's standards. But in those days, it didn't matter because people were listening to Apogees, yep. to BMW 801s, 802s, so everything was inefficient. I mean, that was the, the, the golden age of the super amps. Yeah. So yeah, big power amps were starting to surface. I mean, it's quite interesting that Celestian's demonstration room for the SL600 used two um, C Audio 1000-watt PA amplifiers that, that were monster amplifiers, but they, it sounded phenomenal. 
it, it was absolutely phenomenal. At the time, which which UK company was maybe Cord was making big amps like that? What company was making huge amps like that? Um, that's not oh, exactly what? around what? that. Quad would have made some reasons. Big amps. Yeah. yeah. Meridian was starting to make big amps. Um, Audio Lab had some good amplifiers. Uh, interestingly, the service department used Audio Lab's uh, amplifiers at Celestian. But as by the time your ones were developed, they were using Krell KSA 100s, so big, beefy Krell amplifiers. Yeah, my one of my favorites is the KSA 150. That was yeah. an amazing amplifier. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Peter, Peter Comio, who I had here a couple of weeks ago, told me that he used the Audio Lab in the development of the uh, of the um, Lintons. Also, uh, one of the amps. He also used it, the Quad Artera, which I believe you have. Uh, I've got the Quad Artera preamp. Yes, I have. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Audio Lab's a really nice sounding amplifier. The 8000 series from a long time ago is a very good amplifier. It it would be a good amplifier to voice loudspeakers too, particularly if you're trying to get that vintage sound, which the Lintons uh, emulate well. Yeah, I have yet to try them. I always liked, you know, the uh, while the Japanese were fighting for the super receiver in the late yeah. 70s, and the 80s, the late 70s, because the 80s became the, the plastic, black plastic plate. Yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, the British always had the low power integrated amps that just sounded phenomenal. I mean, there's nothing better than a Creek or a Rotel, a 15 watt per channel Rotel. I mean, that, that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. It's like it's like my, my Miata, my convertible. You know, you can use all of the power all of the time. Yeah. You know, and you never have to destroy anything with it. It just sounds great at full power. So that, uh, that's a Mazda MX-5 over here. Is, is yours a Miata? Yeah. yeah. They are well, great. My, my, mine is a Fiat, but it's made by Mazda. So basically, oh, I, just, okay. Okay. I call it a Miata because people get confused. Yeah. I often find that car analogies work well with hi-fi. Um, you know, the, 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 you're quite right. that You've got a very nimble sports car that you can use all of the time. And it's very true with some of the lower powered amplifiers that the only trouble is, although they will work an inefficient speaker, you won't get the most out of them. Um, yeah. it, you, you really need a, a good gutsy amplifier to because they, they'll draw so much current. Yeah, and if we are in the subject of Celest Celestion, then we must keep talking about powerful amps. <laughs> I <laughs> yeah, guess. I mean, the impedance dips on uh, SL series are pretty torturous. So if you've, I mean, I ran my SL700 SEs on uh, 2A3 single-ended triode amplifiers. So they'll work on low-powered amps, but it was a very near-field setup. You didn't get any of the real huge dynamic swing it just wasn't possible so they'll work but you won't you won't get the most out of them you need power wow so when you started working at celestion were they still making this uh um because you're you're quite young so you know oh yeah uh, I, I, so i i actually did work experience do you, do you have that over there where you go for two weeks to, while you're at school you go to a workplace for two weeks uh no i mean i don't mm. know Okay, so, so over here, when you're at high school, for two weeks, they send you out into the world of work to give you oh, some experience. I think and that's I, called maybe vocational school or something. But I yeah. went to music school, which is a total disaster. It kills people. <laughs> it, it, it destroys them. Yeah, conservatory. <laughs> well, I, I went to Celestium because okay. from, from the age of 11, I'd always been interested in loudspeakers. I'd quickly discovered that if you unplugged a pair of speakers and put a different pair in, it sounded different straight away. So I demanded to go to Celestium. Um, and when I was there, I was just fascinated by the place. It, 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 it was just incredible. There was just speakers being made, all kinds of stuff. And when I left school, I just wanted to go and work there. So from 17, I, I, I went straight there. Wow, and and that's your friend, the technical director. How did you? Uh... Now, oh, that's an interesting story. So, right. 
Ed was the technical director in the about 1980 or about 84 to about 87 yeah um so i i he'd been gone several years by the time i started there oh okay and i found ed uh actually to this incredibly long post that he'd put on a, a hi-fi forum basically correcting somebody where they got it all wrong and I thought, wow, this guy really knows his Celestian. He really does. Oh, wow. And there was, at the time, hardly any reference to Ed Form, which is, is really bad because he's been in, in and out of the audio industry for a long time. He worked at Tannoy. He worked at H&H &H Acoustics. He was friends with Peter Keeley. You know, the names he can rattle off that he's worked with or met is is enormous. Um. So I replied to this thread, and that I think it was from maybe 10 years ago, and his email address was much the same. So he replied, and we had a long chat. I met him, and I've bombarded him with questions ever since. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, so because of this, and also because you were when you were younger, how come that you got so excited about speakers? That w were your parents or... Or any relatives involved in the audio industry? or just... No, not really. Um, my mum's brother, my uncle, had a Technics um, silver stack system, which I found very impressive as, as a child. My grandmother liked classical music. My dad played guitar and was in a folk band, so I was always surrounded by music. Mm. Um, but I did a video on this, uh, my first system, and my first thing was a record player just a portable record player and it was through that that i realized if i got rid of the plastic basic speakers and put a proper box speaker in a cabinet speaker they were just way better and from 11 to today i've been playing about with loudspeakers oh that that's fantastic how many uh, is your is your wife around i mean how many speakers <laughs> How many speakers do you have today that you're allowed to divulge in this information? Well, in this house. Um... <laughs> you have to specify, in this house. <laughs> How many, many houses do you have? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's probably about probably about six or eight pairs in, in here. Um, yeah, I, I mean, some of the higher end ones I've kept here to switch around the uh, are very helpful if I'm doing a review on something or if I'm just curious. Most recently, I wanted to answer the question of the battle between Spendor and Harbeth. Mm. So I, I got a set of Harbeths to answer that. Um, th that's, that's the only good way. Good. It's a good yeah. excuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I needed to do it to find the answer. I had to I had to know because, it, <laughs> it, you know, it, it's great to go into a, uh, you know, to go to hi-fi shows, to go to your local hi-fi shop. I encourage you should all do this, yeah. but you won't really know until you've got them at home in your own system with your own music. And I mean, I can identify the sonic characteristics of a loudspeaker with very quickly, very quickly sometimes in a matter of seconds that you can yeah. just tell straight away but to really really know if it's something you want you need to live with it for a long time many 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 hours and that will also give you an answer that if you've lived with it for hours you're able to listen to it for hours probably means it's a speaker you like um if it's something you're turning down very very quickly and not enjoying then that's not for you Okay, that's that sounds like a plausible uh, situation. Yeah, right? I mean to to deal with. Yeah. So about about six or eight pairs, but in total, I I, I wouldn't publicly admit that. <laughs> I don't feel so bad now. I, just, <laughs> I try to get rid of my stuff. I keep trying to get, uh, you know. Here's a question for you: ha, ha, Is there a pair of speakers that you got rid of that you wished you hadn't? All the time. In <laughs> fact, I have those EPOS ES11 there that... Oh, that's Robin Marshall. Yeah. 
Actually, that's a sad story. My sister, I went to, I was playing in an orchestra in Mexico and my sister stayed in my apartment in New York and her boyfriend told her that the speakers didn't work. Right. So she threw them in the garbage. No, you're joking. I had another pair. Yeah, they were walnuts. And because they had the by wiring, they had a by wiring post. Her boyfriend didn't know anything about hi fi. Right. And so I guess he thought the tweeters were dead. I don't know. He didn't know how to connect them. He didn't buy wiring. So they okay. threw they threw my speak. I still once in a while, if I even make a hint of reminding her, she'll stop she stop talking to me for years. <laughs> so I can't even I can't even complain about it. And also, also, I had Meridian M20s in the past. Uh, I regret, um, I don't know. I mean, I I regret a lot of speakers that I used to have. I even had a pair of, uh, of Haybrooks that were really nice. Um, it was like the typical formula. It was like a light box that you could, it sounded kind of hollow. Yeah, lossy uh, cabinet. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's a big, that's a big, we should talk about that. That's a big British thing. You know, the sound of the cabinet is important. Um, but yeah, I, I miss the 801s. I used to have 801s. Uh, what, well, Bowers and Wilkins? Yeah, the Matrix. Yeah. Matrix 2, the ones that um, were. So that's Lawrence Dickey. That's Lawrence Dickey. He came up with the Matrix concept shortly after Celestian did the Aerolam. Um, uh, there's an interview somewhere where Lawrence Dickey is very, um, <laughs> what's the best way of putting that? Uh, not, not jealous, but respectful admiration. Why didn't I think of doing that? Because it was revolutionary. It was very, oh. very, very clever, hugely difficult to make. And Celestian continued making very difficult to make loudspeakers. We can go into that in depth in a little while. The, the BBC lossy cabinet thing is really down to a couple of people. I, I would credit Dudley Harwood big time with that. He, he was right at the top of acoustic design. And Dudley Harwood obviously founded Harbeth. One of the other famous people at the BBC is obviously Spencer Hughes, who went on to found Spendor. Spendor uh, yeah. the, these guys were true, what they call golden ears. They, they could just tell. Um, there's lots of people who, you know, I, I can't mention all of them, but lots of people at the BBC were very, very clever, very clever people. But amongst these people, I wanted to ask you, because in Russia, they had the big five composers. And then in France, they had Les Six, you know, they had the, the big six composers that everybody, right. listened, you know, the music was very successful. So there must be like a group of three or four or five designers that are, uh, um, probably world famous British designers would be um, would be Kelly, Peter Walker. Yes. Yeah, definitely. We need to him. hear the the angelical choir. I can hear whenever you say <laughs> Peter Walker. Um, I, singing. I would say Spencer Hughes definitely. Um, I mean, he he made that first cone for the BC one using a bed post. Uh, a heater and a, a compressor working backwards to, to vacuum format. I mean, that's very clever. Um, As the, back, the back string? Is that the back yeah. string? Yeah, for the BC1, yeah. Um, I mean, there's lots. It, 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 Stuart Tyler of Proac. Uh, yeah. Loads, and, loads and, and loads of loads. And Kef? Um, wow. Kef would originally be, so Malcolm Jones was very clever uh, drive unit guy so he he did the b110 the t27 i think the b200 the b139 um obviously laurie fincham worked for kef very famous in more recent years would be andrew jones um a lot of people would have heard of andrew jones no but i met i met uh, an old man at kef what was his you haven't mentioned his name yet uh so raymond cook was yes um, Kef's founder, yeah. I, I met him once at a CES in Chicago in 1991 or 92. Wow. And I told him, I just graduated from Juilliard, and I told him that I played the oboe. It turns out he was married to the daughter of a famous composer. Uh, no, a famous oboist, but his brother was also a composer. I can't remember his name now, anyway. Um, 
And so he told me that his uh, his estate they were gonna they were gonna sell. You can actually see the fluff in the air from my <laughs> my dog. From the yeah, um, they were gonna sell his instruments uh, okay. on a, on an auction. And so um, when I got home, I was in Puerto Rico at the time, and he wrote me a very nice letter. I still have it somewhere. Really? Um, yeah, he was a very nice man, and, and he was very impressed that I played the oboe and that um, I will remember the name of the composer. But anyway, he wrote an oboe concerto for his brother. So he was married. Raymond Cook was married to the daughter of this. Um, wow. Yeah, of this oboist. Ed told me that Raymond Cook was quite a showman when it came to to displaying his speakers at the hi-fi shows, that he was something that is probably missing now, to be honest with you. Yeah. I've got to admit, the last hi-fi show I went to, um, the Kef guys were, were very good, but uh, according to Ed, that the Mr. Cook was just very flamboyant, very, very interactive and made it a nice experience. Mm. Yeah. And I also I also met the people at TDL, also yep. the old man at TDL at the show. And I remember seeing these great speakers that I've never heard of ever again. Ruark. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's O'Rourke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were beautiful speakers, but yeah. I, I don't know anyone that owns them or had them or they were expensive. And I think they were they went together with the Roxanne. Maybe the um, same distribution or something? I don't know. Possibly. The, 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 I, don't, I don't know that. But Ruark were highly regarded. They're, they're, they're really good. I mean, there's lots of loudspeakers that fall through the net. I mean, Royd is another one that, that are really, really good. Ram is another one from Britain that's really never good. Heard. No, they just fall through the net. Very small but very good manufacturer of loudspeakers. Um, it... This is kind of why I like some of the history, particularly Celestian's history, but some of the history attached to it, because you do find that this all sort of filters out, if you like. The hi-fi community is quite small, but when you trace it back, it, it's fascinating stuff. The same as any history is, really, but the, the loudspeaker one is, is really interesting. But it's quite a departure uh, for the Celestian Ireland cabinet, because it all came, it's supposedly... It all came from the LS, LS5, LS3, uh, you know, this group of people that developed the BBC monitors and then they kind of split, right? And they all went into their own companies, like yep. Stuart Tyler and... Um... Yeah, so Stuart Tyler is Celef, and then which right. is Celestian and Kef, because he used both companies' drive units in his early stuff. And then Celef, uh, became Proac, which is very famous, but still Stuart Tyler, who we sadly lost last year. Yes. Um, so uh, the, the BBC concept is a thin wall, lively cabinet that's damped with bitumen panels. So the energy is absorbed by the panels, turning it into heat. By the time the SL6 was in development, which would have probably been the late 70s into the early 80s, the lossy cabinet idea was starting to be phased out by the Celestian engineers. They they thought the way forward was rigidity. Um, now and this is because they were using the laser interferometry, right? So the laser interferometry helps with the true pistonic motion of the drive units. So Celestian had really focused on drive unit behaviour. And they were trying to push the breakup modes out of the audible range so the, the drive units could travel f further up the frequency range so you could cross them over well within tolerance or the HF unit would break up way out of the audible range. The only trouble is you get that all right, but then you need to get the cabinet right. And the SL6 cabinet, although dimensions are, are lovely, it's not a big speaker, that's got an awful resonance at about 400 hertz, which is starting to get into the mid-band area, the very low mid-band area. So does it's that include, does that again? Include, I keep interrupting you. I'm sorry. Does sorry. that include the SI, the SL6 SI or not? That comes later. So okay. the first the first loudspeaker is the SL6. With the copper tweeter. Yes. 
and that's the first Cobex uh, driver with PVC surround. The chassis is actually from another Celestian loudspeaker called the UL6, which is late 70s design. So basically they kind of used up uh, some components they already had, but made them better. But the cabinet is very coloured at 400 hertz. Very, very coloured. It becomes oh, very light. Okay. So to improve on that, Graham Bank started using material that British Aerospace used in the floors of aeroplanes. And the material is called Aerolam. Okay. Okay. Here, here I'm going to make a, a little break here because this uh, plays into a joke that we, that we do here all the time in which I call the experts the NASA scientists. <laughs> and, and with reason, because as you can see the logo on my cup, yeah. it has a, a NASA. NASA. Yeah. Uh, so whenever somebody gets really smart or get very technical, I call them the NASA scientists. But the reason <laughs> is because a lot of these guys came from the aeronautics and the aerospace industry. Am I right? That's, that's true to a degree. You've, you've, you've got several aspects going on in design. You'd obviously have acoustic design. You'd have chemical analysis. So there'll be chemists who are working on different materials, different rubbers, uh, electrical engineers. There, there's a whole array of people working, you know, together to get, to get the end result. And um, so Graham Bank discovering the... Was the he was he a NASA scientist too? Was he no, an aerospace no, guy? No, oh. no. Grant, Grant Bank was, um, I think he had a PhD in acoustics, but Grant Bank was, was a, a, a loudspeaker designer. Mm -hmm. And he basically turned the SL6 into the SL6 by using the Aerolam cabinet. Mm -hmm. This gets really complicated here, right? Because the Aerolam cabinet is absolutely rigid as anything yeah. incredibly stiff right so it, it does not contribute to the music at all and in it, fact that 400 hertz band probably is what people liked or misunderstood as a great mid-range sound 100 percent. that's coloration it's the same yeah. as the difference between valve amplifiers and solid state amplifiers it could be argued that the valve amplification is distortion but if it's pleasant distortion, it doesn't matter. If it's horrible distortion, your ears soon tell your brain, this is horrible. So coloration at 400 hertz wasn't a problem on the SL6, but to Graham Bank it was. He wanted to get rid of it. Of course. So he pushed that out of the audible band by using Aerolam. The trouble is, the first cabinets were made by a, a um, company that were on an airfield, makes sense, it was aerospace material, in a place called Duxford, which was an airfield. And the first cabinets were actually not that well made, so they had a bit of flexibility. And the demo pairs sounded phenomenal. When it went into production, or started to go into production, they were too well made. They were so stiff. The tolerances got tighter. Yeah. Yep. That they ended up with what's called a bell mode issue. Now, do you know who Martin Collins is? Yes. He was right. a reviewer uh, at the Hi Fi Review and Weather Report. 100%. Something Clever like bloke. <laughs> got written. Hi Fi loads Review of... and Record Report or Record. Yep. And Martin Collins. Said. Martin Collins has written many books on loudspeaker designs. He worked for Monitor Audio. I think he was their yeah. first designer, actually. Yeah. Martin Collins takes an empty Aerolam cabinet up to my friend Ed and says, Ed, listen to this. And he holds it close to his ear, wraps his knuckles on the cabinet, and it absolutely rings like mad and hurts Ed's ears. And Ed said, that's a bell mode meaning that it's ringing around the cabinet. Because it's made out of metal, it rings. But if it's square shape, it doesn't have any... It's still, because of the volume of air that's inside, it resonates. Yeah, so this is an empty cabinet. No drive units, no phone, right. no... Wood, but it's still got a bell mode, which is causing a horrible characteristic in the mid-band. Um, 
Graham Bank had left Celestian now to go to Wharfdale. So this became Ed's problem. And Ed, weirdly, using other people outside of Celestian's group of clever people, worked out that the best thing to do was what they called crack the bell. So if you crack a bell, if a bell's got, it won't ring. It won't ring anymore. So on the uh, bottom right-hand seam, the cabinet is not glued together with traditional glue. It's like a silica, silicon stuff. So it can flex. Kills the bell mode. Bell mode in problem only, gone. In only one place of the cabinet? Yep, exactly. Yep. So when we unbox my speakers, it's they're probably just open. They're probably with time. It may, they might have been no, dragged. no. You'll you'll never break open those Aerolam cabinets. They're stiff as anything. But if you took one apart, when you looked inside the cabinet, the bottom right hand seam will be white because it's silicon holding it together. It's just so it's got a bit of flexibility. Now doing that rectified the bell mode issue, and then they realised just how good the SL six hundred was. Uh, now let's just I just want to track back a little bit. Um, Go ahead. The laser interferometry was in the beginning utilized to to deal with the to, to achieve pistonic motions in the yeah. drivers. It had yeah. nothing to do with the boxes. But no. then the drivers got so good yeah. that that got ahead of the box and then the box was kind of lagging behind. Yeah. I see. So Graham realized that the next issue in the chain of things was the cabinet, which is not too dissimilar to what the BBC discovered, that the cabinet is a very important part of the overall system. It's just the BBC's philosophy was to use a lossy cabinet and damp out the resonant frequencies. Right. Celestian's approach was to make the cabinet as stiff as humanly possible. Now, that does have and can have some disastrous results. Some very, very stiff, rigid cabinets become sonically dead, and it, it wrecks the musicality of the loudspeaker. In yeah, market. it takes sucks, it sucks the life out of it, and also it makes it more inefficient, especially if it's not a vented unit. Um, yeah, so a sealed enclosure is nearly always less efficient. It, it, you, you can gain several dB by it being ported. And also, if it doesn't resonate, that's even more dead. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. But it, it contributes it's, less to the sound. Yes, that's right. So you did ask about the SI. I think you've got a pair, haven't you? Actually, I I just sold those speakers <laughs> to one of my patrons, and I regret it. Oh, dear. <laughs> well, you, you've, got, you've got better ones now. Well, this was a question he had, actually, here. He said, why are the 700s better than the ones I have? And then he has an angry face on it. Are they really better? <laughs> Basically, okay, so just quickly, after the SL6, after the SL6 comes the 600, but the right. 600 is expensive. It's a lot of money. Ed has then developed the aluminium tweeter. So Celestian developed the SL6S which is the wooden one with the aluminium tweeter and the first dual material surround, which was to help reduce standing waves at the edge of the cone and various things. It was an improvement. So it was, uh, just to specify, the dual material was on the woofer. The woofer had, it doesn't have just foam or just booted rubber. It has two components, and that's why it's very impossible to fix, basically. Or yes, so, so it's PVC, is the first leading edge which is Inside. the same yeah which is the same as the original one and then it splits into rubber so part of it to keep the pistonic motion the pvc travels very pistonically then the rubber allows more ex extension that's the, brilliant yeah so the drive unit has also got a different shape a different length uh, bobbin and a different coil winding all of that has to be modified it's got a different chassis as well what they did to rectify the 400 hertz issue in the cabinet is they put what celestian called a figure of eight brace which braced up the cabinet and made it much stiffer it pushes that resonance further out of the audible band your friend's SI are the next version on from that, which are the same drive units, the same cabinet, but they used polycaps in the in the uh, crossover. 
So the topography is slightly different on the crossover, but it's got polycaps in it. I actually like them the least. I think they're hard in the mid-range compared to the S. The SI? The SI, yeah. I and think this the, is why this is why you have a project where you're gonna mo you're modifying them. I have, yeah. It's taken far too long, um, but I've been busy, so I haven't managed to get back to it yet. But I aim to have them finished this year. Um, they're they're nearly done. The trouble is, you 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 can't really improve on what Celestian already did using their components, because some of the best minds that work there worked on these. Um. So all I tried to do was make the best version of the of the wooden cabinet one. So my cabinets are wooden, not Aerolam. Right. I've used the wooden cabinets, and I'm going to use. I've used drive units that have never been put into the wooden cabinets. They're actually the drive units from your speakers, and I've modified the crossover topography and gone really as high end as I could on components. Not ridiculous, but. I've gone for air core inductors, um, better better capacitors, but strangely, I've stuck with L caps on the base circuit because I find poly caps make the mid range too hard. Mm. But but oh, uh, so people know they could uh, maybe buy a kit from you in the future or buy the crossovers oh, from you. Possibly you that time. would be a long way down the road. That would be. I've got to get it right for me before I would yeah. even entertain doing it for somebody else. Um, I, Go on. Are you presently working in the hi-fi industry? No, 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 no. Okay. I do this purely for fun. My okay. my job is selling um, bikes, push bikes, high-end racing bikes. Oh, cool. Yeah, totally different. Yeah, that's very but, nice. But it pays the bills and feeds the habit. <laughs> Absolutely. Unfortunately, yes. Yeah, As, yeah, yeah. Speaking of, a lot of the people that we have here, uh, they don't speak English, so... They're actually kind of talking to amongst each other and they may, might be getting a little bored. So why don't we just do the unboxing now and then we can continue to talk about them, especially if it's really good or really bad. Sure, <laughs> definitely. No worries. Okay, Mihen. Sure. Um, the, there is one thing that is missing, unfortunately, from yours is the dedicated stands. Um, yes. I, I will work on trying to source you a pair. I know where a pair are. But it's whether the guy wants to get rid of them or not. I, I'll ask him. You don't think that this will work? They will work, but you'll find there'll be a sonic benefit if they are on the proper stands. What is the you, material of the dedicated uh, stands? Is it magnesium? Uh, I think they're aluminium. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure they're aluminium. Um, okay, the packaging is good. Good. They're bubble wrap. Now, the strange thing with Aerolam is it's really quite strong in the sense of if you stood on those, they would handle your weight. But if you dropped something onto the cabinets, they would dent very easily. It's a strange yeah, I've material. Seen, I've seen pictures of them with holes in them, like somebody yeah. put a hole through them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very easily damaged. Well, nice and bubble wrap. Yeah, they've done a good job. All right, let's see. What do we have? Also, I got to be careful with the razor blade, right? Yeah, be careful with that. That will, that will scratch the next day paint quite easily. It will be very easy to slice it with a razor blade, too. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you see the comments, if there's questions here. Do you see um, questions? Let me see if I can see him. Uh, I think somebody asked the, dif the difference between the late 60s. Uh, do you remember the red driver speakers? I don't know what that, Serving Vega? No. <laughs> what, with the red, uh, red or orange surrounds? That was Serving Vega, yeah. Yeah. Um, we don't have photos here. The only other ones I can think of in, in UK would have been a company called Richard Allen. They had red surrounds, but it was concertina, not foam. Um, they're pretty rare. They turn up every now and again. You probably never heard of Richard Allen speakers. They're they're another one that. No. Yeah. 
Ah, uh, let's see. Oh, JPW. Do you remember the red driver speaker, JPW? Red one. Um, no, I don't. I, I don't. Interesting story about JPW. Um, the Labour, so the, the assembly of the cabinets, was done by uh, prisoners, inmates. Really? Yeah, cheap, cheap labour. <laughs> so uh, prisoners were assembling the loudspeakers in the early days i believe that's true but jpw i can't remember that one i i wouldn't mind doing that as a prisoner rather no, than no. construction the, work you know much better jpw actually had the license for ls 35 as as well but it's debatable whether they ever actually made any Good job here. They surrounded the, the square shape thing. And actually, they use they use painter tape, so I don't even have to use the razor blade. All right, good. It's, it's people, do you know people often use um tape and it's just impossible to get them off. <clears throat> okay, here we go. We're getting there. I'll be surprised if yours have got this in there. Okay. Now, we are not certain that these are special editions. I no. was told, but we're going to have to check, right? There's only one way to find out. There is only one way to find out, and you'll need an Allen key to remove four bolts, and then we'll, all will be revealed. Oh. So just quickly, there's a common mistake a lot of people say that the SL series, the 700, was actually called the Celestian 700, and the special edition was called the SL 700 SE. Mar the marketing department, for some reason, decided that the special the 700 should just be called the Celestian 700. I'm listening. Celestian's a hundred years old. Um, in not next year, it, in two years' time, it's a hundred years old. That I knew. I knew they're a very old speaker yep. company. Started by Cyril French in 1924. Wow. Yeah. That's right at the beginning of RCA. I mean, a little after RCA. Yeah. 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 Um, I spoke to Cyril French's, uh, must have been his great grandson, um, oh, several years ago, um, and, and he showed me he had some of the original adverts from the 1930s, which were hand painted. Okay, I see something here. Right, you're nearly there. I can see grey Nextel paint. The back is. Uh... Seems okay. Yep. No big holes or dents anywhere. That's good. So both the uh, Celestian 700 and the SL 700 SE were bi wireable. Now, they did have some 800s after that, or not? No. 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 So at the end of the SL range, you had the Celestian 100, the Celestian 300, and then the flagship, very rare, Celestian King. Okay. Here we go. That looks familiar. Drum roll. <laughs> They're very well packed. And they have feet in the bottom. They have rubber feet. N now, that is the cups for the proper stands. Oh, yeah. They're not rubber. No, nope. part of the cabinet. Okay. So, on the bottom, it seems good. On the bottom, you'll see that there's four, uh, three cup with um for a cone to sit in and then there's two bolt holes okay so the original stands bolted to the bottom of that loudspeaker okay okay it has 
four corners. There is a little bit of chaffing here and there, but why can you? That's fine. That's fine. Hey, I haven't seen a pair for mm, two years. I had a pair about two years ago. Before that, I had a pair for 20 years. This one has a little dent here. That's okay. It's not pierced it. It's not punctured it. Yeah. You can live with that. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So, yeah, on the bottom, you've got those three inverted cones. Right. And then you've got two uh, threads where you bolted the stands to the speaker. That's why it's important to have them. Ah. It will work. It will be absolutely fine. But the the, the proper stands were, were matched to the speakers. Now, let's see if we can see what's going on with the driver, with the woofer, which we know it's a little bit cracked. Were both of them cracked or just one? Yeah, I think pretty much both. But let's... Right. It's not falling apart. It just has some cracks. No, no. But it's not, what it's not happens happening. is ultraviolet radiation sets off a chemical reaction between the PVC and the rubber. And the PVC is okay. The rubber splits. Mm. I will I, I will help you fix those. No problems. Wow, that's amazing. We're going to make a nice uh, video about this, I guess. Yeah. Are the tweeters okay? No dents, no damage? Let me put my glasses on. They seem fine, and the protector is fine, too. At least Good. this one. We'll have to see the next speaker. Right. This is my cartridge collection. <laughs> Some of them. I haven't got as many as that. I like cartridges. <laughs> Steve Gothenburg uh, interviewed me twice. And uh, on the first one, I, I show him also. I, I got him into that now. He got a technique so he can play with cartridges. All right. You have a technique too, right? I have an SL 1210 Mark II from 2005. Yep. Okay, great. That's what I used to have, a Mark II. Yeah. Mark, and, mine's... Uh, Somebody is asking a question. What current production British style monitor is compatible with a 300B single-ended amp? Huh. Okay, a 300B is more powerful than a 2A3, which is what I had. Um, I mean, LS35As would be tremendous, although they're higher impedance. You, they, I would probably go LS35As. That would be my, my call for that. Sound phenomenal. I saw a video where you drove a pair of these with your uh, with your two A three amp. I think yep. I even commented on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will it, it will power them, but you just won't get the big swings in dynamic range, and it and it won't fill a big room. It just won't. You're a big fan of the LS three five A, huh? Oh, I love LS three five A's. Yeah, they're magical. You? Yeah, they're they're fantastic. First time I heard them, a friend of mine who we lost recently also, a trumpet player in the orchestra in Galicia, in La Coruña, in Spain. In his apartment, he had a pair just on a bookshelf, you know, with books. And he had a Cyrus, the original oh, Cyrus yes. integrated amp. And he was just playing some piano music. And I could not believe <laughs> the sound that came out of that thing. They're unbelievable. They he wasn't are... all dogging, you know. He wasn't like, you know, trying to show off or they were on shelves. <laughs> they were not even on stands. Nope. But the sound that came out was so realistic. Yep. I mean, they were designed to be used in the back of, of vans. So there'd be a little mobile studio van. So they'll, they'll work anywhere, really. Um, I love LS35As. I, I, I think they are a truly wonderful loudspeaker. Well, uh, my EPOS ES11s also, they come with covers. Instead of grills, they come with plastic covers. I guess that's it. they're trying to sell them as band speakers too. <laughs> yeah, they're Rob, they're Robin Marshall designed. Uh, Robin Marshall was inspired by Boaz Eli Eli, who designed Celestian's Copper Tweeter. Um, there's a lot of people who think he sort of copied Celestian realistically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Speaker number two. Bar okay. This one, it's uh, in better shape Yeah. before I drop it. They're very <laughs> rare. We didn't make many of them. 
Okay, the Twitter seems fine, and the woofer only has two cracks. Right. Uh, well, but look at this. I don't know. What do you think? What do you see on this one, Kevin? Oh, the, the grill is wrong. The faceplate is the wrong way around. Oh. Yeah, that's Somebody that means. This? Yeah, somebody's taken that off. Have you got a set of Allen keys nearby? Of course I do. Brilliant. If you remove that faceplate, this will be the big reveal whether they are Celestian 700 or SL700 SE. Right. So what I'll do, if they're SEs, I'll hold this up. And, I'll, <laughs> and, I'll, and I will post this to you. If they're not, you've still got a very good pair of loudspeakers. <laughs> I'll have to buy from you then. <laughs> right, yeah. Now there, there, there's there's there is some advantage to them not being special editions. I'll I'll explain that when we've had a look. Yeah. Okay, so four point five is not either. I think maybe a four. Uh, should be a five. I'm sure there are five mil. Well, in this case, there are four, but this is okay. millimeter. Then there's star. Uh, they're definitely not torques. They're definitely an Allen key. There's also SAE, S A E. Okay. But I Maybe got it's the a four. Give well, it, get one. Yeah, okay. So let's let's find out. So far, so good. Let's see. Do we get the uh, camera, action camera? <laughs> Any more questions? Yes, my friend says, a good oboist always has all the right tools. <laughs> now, okay. the reason I didn't know what number it was, because when I opened my Allen keys, there's only one that's gone shiny on the end, and that's the one to remove the SL face plate. Oh. <laughs> Would you know anything by the serial number or not? No, it's impossible okay. to tell. There's only one way to tell. Uh-oh, I'm getting nervous now. Well, they're not very tight. That's a good thing. No, I think somebody's opened that up. That that faceplate would not have been wrong from the factory. Why is this removable? Is the crossover here? No. Um, the the Celestian 700 and the SL700 SE had a lower faceplate um, to increase rigidity on the front baffle. And the only way to attach it was to bolt it on. Oh, so it's not cosmetical. It actually has a... It, it does add some aesthetics. The, the cabinet looks more finished with that. Yeah. I well, had to like get... A, like a monocoque chassis kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Basically. I had to get some made for mine. I got mine 3D printed. Um, I, it's not easy to see on the video, but mine say SL6 SE, which never existed. They're, I, I, they're my own pair. Oh, yeah, I noticed. I was wondering about that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, right. I'm able to try this with my... It should. There you oh, go. I did. Yes. That's all right. Okay. Okay. Wow, this is metal. Yep. Casting. Yep, they were cast faceplates in a That's company just, just down the road from where I live in Woodbridge. They could have done plastic. Could have done. But no, they decided to go metal. Yep. Wow, kudos to them. Okay, moment of truth. Hold that up to the camera. Oh. Now I need a different... Uh... Now I can tell from there. I'll bring it just a tad closer. Those are... They're not. Celestian SL... No, they're 700s. So ah! they're not... They're not. They're not. No! It doesn't matter. I'll tell you why. The advantage is the SL700 SE had unique base drivers and unique tweeters the celestian 700 uses the same base driver as the sl6 s and si oh so it can be repaired easier yep okay maybe now, i can show here what so people can see what what we mean what you mean when you talk about the the double surround yeah that's a dual material surround now the way you identify the difference between the 700 and the se is your Allen screws are chamfered and countersunk into the basket. On the SE, they weren't. They were 
Phillips screw heads on a flat chassis. Ah. I wouldn't take that as bad news, to be honest with you, because yeah. they're both very good, but yeah. one of them's a lot more fixable than the other. So this is more serviceable. However, the uh, the SC has more base, right? It does indeed. I suppose what we could do, it would take a little bit of work, but we could turn those into special edition ones. You can? But you can. You'd need to find the base drivers. Um, they're not very common. Uh, it would no. be hard. And what I would really rather do is keep those in spec the way they were meant yeah. to be. I'm okay. with. Listen, I have yeah. quads. I'm used to not listening to bass. All the time. <laughs> I wouldn't take that out yet, not the base driver. Oh, no? No, nah, there's no, no need. That is 100% a Celestian 700. All right, because you told me now, that it was a gap, the gap in yeah. the... Yeah, yeah. Okay. The only thing, other thing you could do is remove. put that the right way around now. <laughs> yes. The only other thing you could do is remove the grill off the other one just to check if they're the same. But do that, do that in your... Ah, in your yeah. Maybe maybe this was replaced with a different woofer. Possibly, yes. Because the plate was put in wrong, they maybe used the SL6 woofer. Yep, yep, possibly. That would explain. Uh, but then I have a mismatch. Well, it's okay. Base doesn't matter so much. We, we, we the, the only trouble is is then we'd have to try and work out I'd have to see the crossovers then to see which was which. Because the crossover on the 700 is slightly different to the 700 SE, but I, I would need to see that it's pretty detailed to know. You can Interesting. probably adjust this, it by, you know, you can adjust it in the crossover, the, whatever the mismatch is, but you have to listen and test. Ooh, and, it, it, it would yeah. be difficult. So, an interesting fact the crossovers in both of those and the 700 SE are not mounted to anything. They float inside the foam. What? Yep, they're not They're not screwed to the cabinet. They float in the foam. Are they protected by some foam surround or not? So you've got panels of foam at the back of the cabinet that jam them into place. Celestian did that twice. They did that on the Celestian A2 as well. That's got a floating crossover. The idea being that it didn't interfere with the sound waves inside the cabinet. They were always trying something. Okay, the moment of truth. And yeah. so this one only appears to have one. No, it has two cracks. It has a few. They're emerging. Yeah. The, it's really strange. I mean, I had mine for 20 plus years and they never cracked, but mine were never in sunlight. And I, I pretty much worked out it's UV that, that causes the problem um, because there's no rhyme or reason to it. It's strange. Right, don't pull that too hard. That's it. You want to lift that up rather than to you. Right, probably, maybe I'll uh, stop it with this. Yeah, it's probably stuck. Yeah, oh, that because... one's that's not been removed. So that what's happened there is the paint has is, is stuck it together. I would be careful removing that. It might pick. I would say that's never been a part. Let me just try from from here, just from from the hole, maybe. Have you got some? Have you got a, a plastic, uh, something plastic? Yeah, like a credit card kind of thing. Yeah, it probably need to be a bit stronger than that. So if you go in between the slot, that's it, and then twist it, it might come up. You might have to work around it. No, it's not well, uncommon. I, I heard, I heard it a click. I heard a click. Yeah. Okay. Work your way around. It's, that it's will working. Eventually... I hear the sound of paint becoming yeah. peeled. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Peeling paint. No, I got there we it. go. That's never been a part, that one. And that's also a 700. I can see it from here. Really? So they're matched. They're matched pair. That's how they should be. Yeah. What I'll do, I will I'll still send you this. <laughs> Consolation. <laughs> Consolation prize. 
<laughs> you promise, so now I have to. <laughs> yeah. Why is the woofer installed this way? I'm sure there's a sonic reason why. Um, huh, that's interesting. So, the original SL6 was just a round chassis. The faceplate holds it in place. Um, Boothroyd designed the look of the SL series. Really? No wonder yep. I like him so much. Yep. I like his stuff. Now, to keep the look all the same, they had to mount the driver offset so the faceplates would fit back on. So you could, okay. Yeah. And this 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 basket looks pretty heavy duty too. Yeah, cast aluminium, yeah. That's yeah, amazing. heavy. Yes, good good quality. So the cone material is Cobex, um which is is basically a plastic. You'll notice that the cone and the um dust dome are all one piece. Yeah. There's no separate dust dome. It's all molded in one piece, very clever uh, sort of manufacturing there. Yeah. The the voice coil mounts directly to the back of the whole cone. They're really tough drivers. They'll they'll really take a pound, and they're very very good. Well, good because somebody just asked, how good are they for rock? Celestian speakers love to rock. Celestian. Oh, they, they make they make guitar speakers. They make they electric guitar speakers, right? They still do. They still yeah. do. Yep. So, do you think? Do you want me to put them on? Do you want me to try them? I mean, sure. I, I can't I can't put a lot of bass on them because of the surrounds, right? The surrounds will be fine. They won't crack anymore. But what will happen is you'll have a mild air leak. They're chuffing, chuffing. It, yeah, you probably won't hear it to begin with. So I would play something subtle. And what you'll find, those have incredibly magical mid-range that's superior to the wooden ones. Really? Because those yeah. were already amazing mid-range. These are extra amazing. I've never heard them. Yeah, I've never heard a pair. Yeah, I, 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 I shouldn't have sold mine, but I wanted something new. So I sold mine, and that funded buying the Spendor Classic 2.3s. All right. Buy wired. I got the buy wired cables. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? Alguna más preguntas? Háganle preguntas. What current? Oh, you already answered the question about the 300B. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna let me fix the camera. Let me not give your um, give your viewers some um, some native tongue because they're probably bored of hearing my voice. Okay, mis amigos, ahora voy a conectarlas a ver si funcionan. Okay, así que no se vayan, quédense. Vamos a ver qué pasa. Si tienen alguna pregunta, háganle la pregunta a Kevin. Para eso lo tenemos aquí. Okay, let me remove the, uh, all the foam. This is very well packed. It's a lot of packing. That's good because they're easily damaged. They really are easily damaged. Actually, it's funny because uh, they're exactly uh, almost around the same size as the Epos. I'm afraid I would say Robin Marshall really quite blatantly copied Celestian when he did Epos. It's probably going to be controversial, but um, there's a lot of people who think he copied the SL series. So now, right off the bat, I'm going to have a problem with this. I'm going to have to use uh, BluTac. Yeah. What cable do you normally use? Uh, I have a straight wire, and I also have... Uh, some from Chris Somovingo that he makes. Right. I like Cardas too, but I can't afford it. <laughs> Have you, uh, you ever had quads in your house? Uh, 57s, no. No, no. I've heard them loads of times, but they, they wouldn't work in my room. I can't get the width. They would be in the way of the door into the kitchen. So <laughs> I don't think they're going to work. Do you have a preference for which quads? Um, for nostalgic reasons, I'd probably say the 57s. Um, the 63s, the 63s, I, I mean, they were big when I first really got into loudspeakers. Um, the quad boys often used the Celestian um, System 6000 subwoofers with ESL 63s. 
Yes, that would be great. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've got a set of System 6000 subs. They're they're incredibly coherent. They're very fast. Um, just another clever design. They were Graham Banks' idea. <laughs> What are you going to charge me? Oh, I'll to, get, <laughs> to sort out the base drivers. Um, we'll we'll we'll, talk, we'll discuss that offline. I, I can certainly help you out. Um, just a bit about those loudspeakers. The their level of detail, particularly in the upper mid um, to HF area, is stunning. But their imaging is just phenomenal. They are very holographic they really do disappear but it's a shame you can't quickly go back to the sl6 si but what you'll detect is just such a lack of coloration they are just so uncolored so clean very very good loudspeakers um oddly my favorite in all of the range is the original sl600 that's my favorite they're very rolled off in the hf yeah but you can play them really loud. You can really, in, I love them. I, I've always kept a pair of those. And that's the one that came with the pair of woofers. I mean, it didn't come with, but you could get as a system. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, which I've got. Um, I, <laughs> I was always waiting to have two matching power amps to run it properly. Mm. And um, I had two Meridian 557s. And rather than trying to set the System 6000 up properly, I started messing around with uh, monoblocking and, and stuff. And it just sounded worse. So I just went back to one single amplifier and sold it and forgot all about the System 6000 until I'd sold it and thought, ah, oh, <laughs> I've forgotten. Because it's tucked away. It's out of sight, out of mind. I've had the thing for years and years, and you just forget about them. It's a terrible waste. It really is. I, I, I should none of us should hoard stuff because there's somebody yeah. out there that will really appreciate that and love it. Yeah. But some of it is just too hard to let go. So yeah. incidentally, I've decided of the two I'm selling my Harbess. They're, they're, they're going, I'm going to keep which model? Which model? Uh, compact 70 S threes. Oh, wow. You'll get some yeah. good money for them because people are crazy about Harbess these days. They are indeed. They, yeah. They're phenomenal on classic classical music, string quartet, something like that. Just spectacular. But I listen to a lot of different genres of music, and yeah. the Spendor were just better across the range, I thought. As are those. They'll yeah, play I love, anything. I love Spendors. Uh, that's, that's the most fun thing to do there is, I think. You know, it's great to compare amplifiers or CD players or cartridges, turntables. It's great. And it's the same thing. But for me, I just prefer doing it with speakers. How about comparing DAX? DAX, oh, that, that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a nightmare. <laughs> Although the, um, uh, the uh, Atoll I did the other day was just phenomenal. Yeah. Brilliant DAC. But I did ask the question, should a DAC have a voice? Or should it not have a voice? And the conclusion I drew was that that Atoll DAC did have a voice, but it was so pleasant, you just couldn't stop listening to it. It was great. Yeah. Have you heard the Denafrips Pontus too? No, the Denafrips, that's a, a ladder resistor DAC, isn't it? No, I haven't. Yeah. I haven't. Uh, I, I was speaking to my friend today. Personally, my system is is fairly neutral from the point of view of being able to review loudspeakers yeah. which i'll openly admit doesn't make it the most musical setup really um that's why i use something like the spendor because you get the musicality back out of the loudspeakers so if i used your sl700s there 
on my setup would be very cold, very cold sounding setup, but would be quite accurate um, and and give me a, a good sense of what the loudspeakers were doing. It would be the equivalent of when I play uh, my horn. Sometimes I want a softer sound. Instead of using this violet wood bell, I'll use a uh, maple bell. Yeah. And so the speakers um, at the at the very end is the sound that contributes. You know. That's right. That's right. Okay. I mean, changing anything on on a hi-fi setup is really uh, tuning the tonality of of the entire system. And for me, is some people don't agree with me but for me the the easiest and quickest and most impactful way you can do that is to change the loudspeakers uh, somebody, if, they asked a the question the first part of the question was i don't mean to help the chat but what are the genuine successors to classics ls3 5 considering that there's no original drivers anymore that is there are so falcon acoustics okay the, the drive units for the original LS35A were made by KEF, but they were designed by Malcolm Jones. Malcolm Jones started Falcon Acoustics, which is now owned by Jerry Bloomfield, and Malcolm Jones rebuilt, remade the B110T27 for Falcon Acoustics to release brand new LS35As. You can get totally in spec B110s from Falcon Acoustics, 15 ohm ones. I've never heard them. They're not, or oh, they are expensive. I was thinking about the Chinese knockoffs. No, the Falcon Acoustics oh, are expensive. Sound, art, sound artist did a I, I, If you want something that's absolutely true to the very letter of the BBC, it's the Falcon Acoustics LS35A. Absolutely to the letter. Really? If you want something that sounds good, Graham Audio sound good, Sterling Broadcast sound good, the new Rogers sound good, but they none of them can claim to be as faithful to the original design because Malcolm Jones rebuilt the drive units and they're all they're brilliant. They're stunning, the Falcon Acoustics. I'm hoping to do an enormous LS35A shootout soon, um, but it's very hard to collate lots of different versions. Um, yeah, and I'm, I owe a big debt to a couple of people because they're letting me borrow their pair because I haven't got them. I haven't got a specific mm -hmm. one. So uh, I might do that after I come back off holiday. So it may be in September I'll have a good go at a, a big LS35A shootout, maybe including the P3 ESR from Harbeth because people keep asking me about that. I was gonna, that was going to be my next question. How bastardized are they, the P3 SE? Uh, well, um, I, I, I mean, wouldn't say they're bastardized. That's it's how far, of, how far from the LS3, you know, five. a good way, a good way. Alan Shaw using that radial cone technology has built his interpretation of that mini monitor. Um, similar to how Stuart Tyler, I don't know, did like the Proact tablets. It's it's their take on that size mini monitor. So the P3 ESR is not an LS35A, but it, it draws its lineage from that. Um, it's the same as the SHL5 isn't an LS36, but it draws its heritage from that. It's Alan Shaw's interpretation of those speakers. To say whether they're better or not is totally up to the individual. You know, it's very subjective. But... A lot of people have asked me, so I, I, I know somebody who's got P3 ESR XDs. He's going to let me borrow them. I've got a couple of pairs of LS35As. Some other friends have got them. We're going to put them all together and try and do the lot. Sounds like a plan. Yeah, I it's going to be a lot of work. I wish I could be there. But, yeah, we'll enjoy it in your channel. <sighs> Thanks. Okay, well, Kevin, it's been uh, about an hour and a half. I don't want to take any more of your time. I know it's about nine o'clock there, a little bit late. So, yeah, that's absolutely fine. I really, really have enjoyed being on it. Thank you for having yes. me on here. Thanks so much for uh, for being here and holding my hand while I open this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're only there for cosmetic reasons. The stand. So later tonight, I'll I'll set them up closer to the wall and you know a little wire apart and see how. Yeah. I like it. 
SLs don't mind being too close to a back wall, but they don't like side walls. Right, okay. Yeah. So yeah. I used to have my equipment electronics behind this, the speakers, but I moved it out thinking that I would probably need a little more yeah. back wall. I, I should move mine really. I, it, the trouble with all of us, it's it's not space. always easy. Your yeah, space, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though this is a dedicated space, I'm still running out of space. <laughs> You've run out of dedicated space. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm still running out of space. Brilliant. Uh, but anyway, uh, thanks so much for your time and looking forward to more collabs. And uh, you're welcome. I will uh, talk to you about shipping the woofers out to you. Well, we, we, we can do this differently, to be honest with you. I could probably find some um, very good condition units that would just work straight in there. Also, oh. there, is a, there is a way I could help you repair those ones um, that, that isn't that difficult and will they will work properly. They'll right. be stored. Applying yeah. something to the driver. Okay, yeah. I make yeah. I make reads. I make obo reads, so I can work in small spaces. Yep. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll we'll do that. That that will get them working as near as damn it, and then I'll work on providing you with something that will make them a one again. Fantastic. And and uh, and I'll send this constellation. <laughs> <laughs> you you rubbing it on my nose now that I don't have the AC. Honestly, honestly, <laughs> there's they they they're still very special. They are very special. Yeah, they sound pretty good right now when I play them. Yeah. Oh, I, I have one more. What about the crossovers? Are the crossovers going to be out of spec? Do I need to replace caps or? Mm, they're they're poly caps, so they don't really wander out of spec. They have what are called um, uh, auto transformers made by Salta, which is a world famous transformer manufacturer. So you're not really going to have any issues there. If you do take them apart, you'll find the HF circuit and the LF circuit is completely separate. There's, there's two circuit boards inside each one and very, very nice crossover components in there. There's there's no issues with those. Uh, did you make some of those? Maybe did you make my speakers or you came in a little bit later, you said? No, no, there's a no, no, I didn't know that. I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have got onto those. I possibly did a lot well i know i did a lot of 100s and 300s and i know i did loads of celestian threes fives um but sl series i remember seeing them there obviously but I, I i don't remember doing any of the crossovers they were saved for the for the best the best people on the line which usually uh, were, usually were women the tweet uh, department was nearly all women they were very good at winding the coils and stuff oh it's always the case i think quads Quads were also made by the panels were made by women. Yep, um, I think for many years the doping done by, on, on Kef drive units was the same woman. It, it was her job for like twenty something years. She was um, like a legend. She was yeah. a legend. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what if if somebody's watching this video and they got all excited about Celestion and they want to go on eBay? I mean, what what sort of speaker could they get that's an affordable model? That's maybe a newer model. If they cannot get these Celestians, I mean the 700s, um, is there something like the ones that you made that you recommend? So, um, sort of ones that are very good that, that aren't over overpriced would be the DL4 Series 2, the Celestian 3 and 5, which were designed by my friend Martin Roberts. Um, any of the A series, if you can find them, particularly the A compact, is a shockingly good, very little loudspeaker. Um, you know, anybody's welcome to find me on Dittenworks Facebook page. I often get sent messages from all over the world and try and help these people as best I can because there have been instances of the wrong information online or no information online. Um, and this is why I really did as best I could to make the Celestian Facebook page a, a community of like-minded people with the proper group experts. So the Celestian Facebook page actually has some of the designers, some of the engineers, some of the quality control people, one of the technical directors. So we're pretty unique that we've, we've got those people there. That's the page on Facebook where I posted my review of the Lintons, and you it forgave, is indeed. And yeah. you forgave <laughs> me for it. I let it go once. 
<laughs> well, I'll, I'll be sure to uh, collaborate more and more that I know that this is your if, people. If you post those on the Facebook page, then people will go wild. Uh, there's a big, big following for Celestian's SL700s. I'll, I'll do it right now. In fact, yeah. I'll do a little short. I'll do a little short on my YouTube channel. Sure. Some, music, yeah, yeah. some gentle music. I don't want to abuse them. <laughs> Now this, it's a good good group. I, I was actually handed that by um, Howard Popek, who he's admin on loads and loads yes. and loads. I know his and, name. Yeah. Yeah, and he he generously handed that Facebook group over to me, and I just went on a quest to find the right people to help me run it. And thankfully, we've got a really good collection. Like I said, we've got some quality control guys. My friend Matt McNulty, he was one of the QC guys. Neil Terry, he's another quality control guy. Um, Martin Roberts, was he designed the Celestian 300. So there's a great collection of people on there. Wow. Okay, well, I'll be sure to also post this interview in my other channel, with uh, my experimental channel. Yeah, that's in, in, in English, so maybe people will see it there too. Which is the one I watched with the Battle for Britain, which I loved. I, I loved that. Yeah, I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> I have, I have to make more. Yes, I have to put more. Now it's actually over five hundred subscribers. I can't believe it. It was an experiment. <laughs> I, I must keep going. Yeah. Anyway, Kevin, I'll let you go. Uh, I will be in touch. And thanks, everyone. Gracias a todos por estar aquí con Kevin. No olviden suscribirse al canal de Deaton Works. Y hasta pronto. Thank you.